meditation we're going to do is traditionally called the 32 parts of the body. And as it is traditionally done, we're only um, reciting all these different parts and one learns them by heart. But I have changed that into a, um, let us say, more modern way of doing it so that we can actually see what this particular contemplation is supposed to teach us. So, if you're interested in what it says in the scriptures, this is the 32 parts of the body um, contemplation, or it's even called meditation, but we're doing it differently. In order to start, please put the attention on the breath for just a moment. Now imagine that you have a zipper in front of your trunk. And this zipper starts at the top of the head and you make it come all the way down to the legs. And you open the zipper. And now you can take a peek inside. And as you take a look inside of your body, you start taking out the bits and pieces. Whether you know them all or not doesn't matter. Some of them might know all the parts that you find in there, others only a few. It doesn't matter. When you get in there and take them out, try to become aware of the feel of them, what they feel like. Also try to become aware of the place where they're to be found. So you take out the liver and put it in front of you and the gallbladder and then the kidneys, the stomach, intestines, the heart, get a little dish and put all the blood in. Take out the eyes, the teeth, the hair, the nails. The tongue. Now take the lungs out. Take sinews and muscles, tendons, and put it all very nicely and orderly in front of you. If you can think of any other bits and pieces, Take them out, feel them, know where they are, put them in front of you. Now go to the bones. All the bones that you can think of. In the face, head, neck, spine, ribs, arms, legs, feet, small ones, medium ones, large ones. If you are visually inclined, visualize all that. See it with your inner eye. Make a nice neat pile of all these bones 
and observe them. If you've had anything wrong with any of the inner parts, give that particular part a special place. Or if you've had anything wrong with any of the bones, give that particular bone a special place. Because you would have become interested in that part or that bone. Keep it aside. Now, as you've taken out all the bones, obviously the skin is going to shrink and sort of fall into itself. Look at that. And now inquire, if you don't like doing it, why? If you're totally indifferent to it, why? And if you find it relieving, why? These are your three possible reactions. Find out which one you've got. After having found what kind of reaction you have, start putting everything back in. First, the bones. Try to put them in the right place. And as you do that, you can see that the skin takes on its natural way of being the cover for the bones. And now you take a look at all those bits and pieces that are lying in front of you and try to find the me in there. Having put the bones back in, have a look at the bones. Which one is me? Take a look at liver and gallbladder, stomach, heart, lungs, intestines, the blood, colon, everything you've got lying there. And look and see whether there's a me in there. Have a look at the skin that is now covering the bones again. Is the skin me? We're very concerned with it. We're concerned with its smoothness, its color, its appearance. Have a look at that skin. First it was all shrunk, and now it's even quite smooth again. 
Does it say me? Any bones say me? Even though it's back in its right place? And another look at all the inner parts. Is there anywhere amongst them, any place that has a me connotation anywhere now pick up each part by itself take another look at it feel what it feels like some of them you can get replacements for if they should stop working properly. Not all of them. And then, having had another good look and a feel, put it in its proper place. Don't hurry, do it slowly and inquire every time. Are you me? What about the teeth? They can be replaced. The hair. The eyes. the nails. Put them all in their proper places and inquire each time, are you me? Don't forget to take that dish with the blood and put it back in and inquire. Is that me? Some of the bits and pieces might say, all alone, I'm not you, but together with all the others I am. But then have another look. Take them out again and put them in front of you. All together, all in one heap, the whole lot. All together, are they me? Now, having put all the pieces back into their right place, you close the zipper again. And now, 
find out how you feel. Are you relieved that the me is all in one piece again? Or is it of no concern? Or does it change your attitude towards the body? If you feel a relief that you're all in one piece again, recognize the attachment to the body identification. If it changes your outlook towards your own body, recognize the fact that this is the beginning of deep insight. And less attachment. And less craving. And if it's of no concern at all, it may be either indifference, not wanting to get near that kind of realization, or it can be just a repeat of a realization which is already there. Make sure you find out how you feel at this point. And now, for a moment, put your attention on the possibility that one of those bits and pieces that you have taken out and put back into your body stops to function properly. What's your reaction? Fear, dislike, rejection, worry, or just knowing that all manifestations have the inherent nature of stopping to function properly. Pick out any one of the bits and pieces inside, any one of them, and just for a moment, think about the possibility that it may stop to function properly or stop to function altogether. See, recognize your own reaction. And if your own reaction is one of dislike or fear or rejection, can you see that that is embedded in your life? Because it may happen any time and we know that. And so fear 
remains with us. Can you see the lack of liberty that is generated by that? The lack of independence. We depend upon all these bits and pieces working properly. And there's no way we can make sure. Can you stand next to yourself as an observer? Look at all these pieces that you have taken out and put back in. Any one of them, all of them. And recognize the fact that there's no way that we have of making sure that they keep on being satisfactory. We are always hoping against hope that this will happen. Can you recognize the fear that is embedded in that, that it may not happen? Can you recognize the pressure that such fear generates? And can you see that thereby we are dependent upon the constant, uninterrupted functioning of every part of this body? Inquire into yourself what you would do when that stops. And there's only intermittent functioning or reduced functioning or none. Inquire. May people everywhere learn to have less attachment to their bodies and the bodies of others. We're going to become aware of our own death. Visualize it or imagine it or anything that you can do. Be on your deathbed, have any disease that you choose, which you won't be able to at that time, but you can choose it now. And then, think for a moment whether at that time you're satisfied with what your life has been. Do you feel, as you know it now, up to now, that your life is fulfilled, that you have used the time you had from birth to death to the best advantage? 
That's our first consideration. Now, if you feel you haven't, would you like to change that as of now? Would you like to make different commitments? What do you think would give you a feeling of fulfillment at the time of your death? What should your life contain to give you that feeling? If you think that there isn't enough of that in your life, of that which would bring you fulfillment, would you like to start, as of now, to bring that into your life? Is it love? Is it helpfulness? Is it caring? Is it meditation? Is it a goal? Whatever it is that you feel needs to be reinforced, would you like to start? Reinforcing it now. And for a moment, imagine that death is imminent. Are you hoping that it will be a long time still? Or are you aware of the fact that it can happen any moment? And if you become aware of the fact that it could happen any moment, what's your reaction? Do you feel that isn't fair? It shouldn't happen? You'd like to postpone it? Feel cheated? Get angry about it? What's your reaction? Or do you realize death always comes when the life continuum is finished. (coughs) Do you see death, your own death, as a threat to you or as a transition? And if you see it as a threat, ask yourself why. Because you haven't finished what you're doing? Or because it's eliminating the person you're most concerned with? Or because you think 
the world ends, when you end, why are you threatened by it? Can you realize that feeling threatened by it and the fear of it imbues everything that you think and do? Would you like to live without fear, without anxiety, without feeling threatened, without worry? If so, you have to live with your dead. Can you try as of now to incorporate the knowledge of your own death into your daily living so that all you think and all you do has that as part <coughs> of its motivation Can you imagine that death awaits you today? How do you feel about it? <coughs> when it comes, it's always today. Do you realize how you feel about that? I now think of your loved ones. Are you bound and determined that they should survive you? They should not die before you? And can you feel the anxiety that that produces? Can you try and look at things the way they are instead of trying to make them happen the way you'd like them to happen? Nothing gives rise to anxiety more than wanting things to happen the way one wants them to. They do not do that. Death is not a tragedy. It's a natural law. Can you see that? Can you see that the kind of death that we are having or going to have is entirely dependent upon the kind of life we live? And can you see that the kind of life we live is dependent upon 
how clearly we see our own death. Again, what do you think is most important so that when death comes, you feel at ease about it? You can practice not rejecting the body's difficulties and inabilities while still alive. Accepting things as they are. Being at ease. Cherishing each moment that is left to us to practice. Being grateful for each moment, but not imagining that each moment is due to us. Cherish each moment, be grateful for it, but don't think that we ought to have them. See yourself again on your deathbed and have a look inside of yourself what emotions, what feelings are most important so that you have a calm, peaceful transition and practice those now. May people everywhere not be afraid of their own and their loved one's death. How did you know you were on the right path? Clever. <laughs> what needs to happen so one can lay aside all the books, etc., and inform oneself? Well, I have always felt that the most important characteristic that we need to actually go along this path is common sense. And if we have that, and most people do, there are always some exceptions. One knows what's right and what's wrong. I seem to consistently have difficulty with the early afternoon sittings. I have good results this morning and evening sittings. Walking meditation in the afternoon is okay, but sitting has been quite disappointing at this time. Should I keep at it? Should one be able to eventually be concentrated at any time? Eventually. One has to give that time. If walking meditation works in the afternoon, do it. Um, Lenormand and Aponika used to say, the art of the possible. You do what is possible. You do what is possible for you by giving your best. And that's all we can do. 
So walking meditation is fine in the afternoon. I understand that the inner pleasures not related to the senses are exquisite and lead one deeper and deeper onto the path. But why are the sense chords called filthy? Is there more to this translation of this word than attachment? Well, some of these translations are arbitrary. Some of these words were translated when there wasn't even a Pali dictionary yet and are being kept. It's not 100% sure that the Pali translations are perfect. It's a dead language. It does not exist other than in the Pali canon. It's the only place where Pali exists in the Pali canon. So nobody has spoken it in a long, long time, probably two and a half thousand years. And the word filthy refers to the fact that it's of a very gross nature compared to the other pleasures which arise within. As I have determined to practice toward liberation versus more happiness and calm in this life, what caution or counsel do you have to offer regarding the circumstances I have already created in this lifetime, such as my responsibility to partner and loved ones, use of professional training and talent, material possessions, but there's something, oh, resources, resources and possessions over which I have stewardship. Well, first of all, I think I would like to say that liberation is not versus more happiness and calm in this life. On the contrary, if one really wants to work for liberation, one gets more happiness and more calm, otherwise one isn't working towards it. The happiness is embedded in the knowledge that one has put the transcendental ideal ahead of everything else. That's the first happiness. And if we don't get more calm, then, of course, we won't get liberation anyway. So it's not versus, it's part of. The responsibilities to partner and loved ones cannot be shed. They need to be taken care of. But what one practices is to have unconditional love and impersonal love for more people than just those that live in one's house. And the use of professional training and talent, well obviously that would be useful for making a living, living, wouldn't it? And since one has to eat, one also has to make a living. Material uh, resources and possessions. With the material possessions and resources, one can do a lot of good. Generosity is at the apex of the virtues that the Buddha enumerated which are necessary for a bodhisattva, for a person who is working towards enlightenment. Bodhi is a word for enlightenment and sattva are beings, beings for enlightenment. So generosity, the art of giving and the wish to be able to give and therefore use one's resources and possessions but also one's talents that I mentioned and one's training to give to others are immense possibilities for making good karma, for having the happiness of sharing and also for the most important thing we can do in this life helping others, which is also on the pathway to liberation. That's why it's at the apex of the virtues, because when we think of others, the egocentricity is diminished. 
In fact, at the time of thinking of others, it is momentarily eliminated. And therefore, it's right on the path. So, one uses all one has. Huh? The feeling I would most like to have in my heart as I die is gratitude, which is exactly what I feel right now. Can the desire for gratitude also turn into attachment or is it hmm, finished? Or is it oh no, next page. Is it a channel I should consciously attempt to keep open? Definitely. It's a channel to keep open because it's um, very closely connected to love. We can only be grateful to that or to whom we love. So love and gratitude go together. And if one has gratitude in one's heart, one doesn't take anything for granted. One sees all the beauty that one has been offered and is grateful for that. Even in the worst of circumstances, there is still something to be grateful for. So it's something that would should, one should um, cultivate. Yeah. When feelings of gratitude and joy arise spontaneously, when I think of the world of nature, is this a dependency on external conditions which I have been fortunate enough to experience or something more? The feelings are much more feelings of recognition than of personal pleasure. If the feeling of gratitude and joy arises when we either see or think of nature around us, at least we do get the taste of what gratitude and joy is like. And as we do that more often, Gratitude and joy can be anchored in the heart and they are an enormous support system for meditation. Gratitude and joy are actually prerequisites for meditation. The mind is light-hearted. It's not heavy. And a mind that is light can be malleable, pliable, and extend, extensive. And therefore, if we have gratitude and joy in the heart, meditation becomes much easier. So, however we make it arise, certainly with the beauty of nature around us is one way. It's helpful. It's a support system for the meditation, it's a sort of support system for our underlying mood. Some people are not touched by nature. They see it and they think, oh yeah, well, you know, bushes and flowers and trees, so what? But others are really touched by it and have a feeling of the manifestation of beauty and also a feeling of togetherness with nature. That's why we did the uh, contemplation on the elements. So if it's helpful, use it. Whatever is helpful, we can use that. 